is advisable to study the appropriate essential anatomy as outlined in the primer of regional anesthesia anatomy before studying the single injection interscalene block. Single injection interscalene block is almost entirely performed for shoulder surgery. This block is not indicated for surgery of the upper extremity distal to the shoulder joint. The approach used in this production is the longitudinal approach, also called the lateral approach. This approach is used to avoid possible entry into the vertebral neural foramina. It is important to realize that pain, paresthesia, and dysesthesia distal to the elbow is almost never symptoms of bona fide shoulder pathology. It almost always indicates an existing brachial plexitis, and great care should be taken in patients presenting with shoulder pain and pain distal to the elbow. Special care should be taken with patients presenting with frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis, since this condition is a fibromatosis like Dupuytren's disease, which in itself should not be painful. The pain of frozen shoulder is probably due to traction on the brachial plexus due to rotation of the scapula. Also be suspicious when the patient is scheduled for subacromial decompression and it is a very young or old patient. The exact diagnosis of the shoulder pathology can often be unclear in the patient with existing brachial plexitis. Interscaling block may have the potential of aggravating existing brachial plexitis. 15 to 60 milliliters of all known regional anesthetic agents have been used for single injection interscaling block. The choice of this author is 20 to 40 milliliters of ropivacaine, 0.5 to 0.75 percent, or 20 to 40 milliliters bupivacaine, 0.5 percent, or 20 to 40 milliliters ropivacaine, 0.5 percent, or bupivacaine, 0.5 percent plus 0.3 milligrams buprenorphine. The addition of buprenorphine makes the block last up to three times longer, but if long-lasting block is required, it is advisable to place a catheter for continuous infusion. The osteotomes that are included in this block are illustrated in this diagram. When studying this illustration, it should be clear that the inferior part of the glenoid, as well as the distal part of the ulnar and the bones of the fourth and fifth finger, are usually not covered by interscalene block unless very large volumes of local anesthetic agent are used. The C5, C6, and C7 dermatones are usually included in interscalene block, but it should be noted that C8 and T1 dermatones are usually not included. The neurotomes involved in interscalene block include the neurotomes of the axillary nerve, the radial nerve, the musculocutaneous nerve, and the median nerve. The ulnar nerve and brachial and antibrachial cutaneous nerves are usually not covered. Similarly, the intercostal brachial nerves are excluded. The patient is positioned in the supine position with the head slightly turned towards the opposite side and the patient's hand on the operative side is placed on the abdomen. The posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle, the external jugular vein, and the clavicle are marked. Before the skin is penetrated with a needle, all the nerves in the posterior triangle of the neck can be mapped percutaneously. This can be done with a special probe or with the tip of the needle. The nerve stimulator is typically set on 5 to 10 milliamps for this nerve mapping. The operator stands at the head facing the feet of the patient. The phrenic nerve is situated posterior to the sternocleidomastoid muscle at the level of the cricoid cartilage. Moving the probe approximately 1 centimeter posterior will stimulate the superior trunk of the brachial plexus and a biceps motor response will be evoked. Moving the probe approximately one centimeter posterior will stimulate the dorsal scapular nerve, which innervates the rhomboid muscle. If the probe is moved further posterior, the nerve to levator scapulae is encountered. Stimulation of this nerve will cause elevation and rotation of the scapula. The most posterior nerve that will be encountered in the posterior triangle of the neck is the accessory nerve, which innervates the trapezius muscle. Stimulation of this nerve will cause elevation of the scapulae. 
This line marks the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The broken line indicates the external jugular vein. The clavicle forms the caudate border or base of the posterior triangle of the neck. The circled area here indicates the position of the superficial cervical plexus. After disinfecting of the skin with an antiseptic agent, the superficial cervical plexus is blocked just behind the midpoint of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The anesthesiologist stands at the head of the table facing the feet of the patient. The interscalene groove is palpated with the index and middle finger in the area of Winnie's point. These two fingers are now split, leaving the middle finger in the interscalene groove. This causes congestion of the external jugular vein, which makes it easy to identify, and with the index finger, traction is applied to tighten the skin. The needle enters behind the sternocleidomastoid muscle approximately midway between the clavicle and the mastoid process and is aimed at the brachial plexus, which is deep to the middle finger of the left hand of the operator. The needle enters longitudinally and is typically aimed approximately at the nipple on the ipsilateral side. If the needle is aimed too anterior, the phrenic nerve will be stimulated and an unmistakable diaphragmatic motor response will be noticed. The nerve stimulator is typically set to 1 to 2 milliamps, 2 hertz, and a 100 to 300 microsecond pulse width at this stage. Moving the tip of the needle slightly posterior will cause either triceps or biceps motor response as the proximal triceps or distal biceps aspect of the superior trunk of the brachial plexus is encountered. At this stage, the nerve stimulator is turned down to approximately 0.3 to 0.5 milliamps and the brisk motor response should still be seen in the biceps or triceps muscles. If this brisk motor response is still present at 0.2 milliamps, it probably indicates intraneural needle placement and the needle should be withdrawn slightly. Brisk muscle twitches should ideally be seen at a nerve stimulator output setting of 0.3 to 0.5 milliamps. A positive Raj test implies that the motor response immediately ceases after injection of the local anesthetic agent is started, as is illustrated in this recording. This gives additional assurance that the block will be successful and that large volumes of local anesthetic agents and additives are probably not required.